All right, in this lesson, we're going to go over the acquisition method. We're going to go over the consolidation. Um, there's a lot of things on this board, but I think after we walk through it, uh, this will be very easy to kind of understand. Now, before we talk about the acquisition method and before we talk about consolidations, uh, let's give you a little bit of background on what's happening here. Uh, the first thing is the all three examples that we're going to go over are instances in which the acquiree, so the investee, dissolves at the end of the day. So we're dissolving them at the end of the day. So all of the assets become our assets. All of their liabilities become our liabilities when we acquire them. Typically we do this by acquiring all of their stock and or all of their assets at the end of the day. Now, the other thing to understand is everything that we're gonna be doing up on this board looks exactly like the equity method, okay? so. When we talk about consolidations, and remember we talked about three types of combinations. We talked about three statutory combinations, okay? Uh, the first two statutory combinations, this is what it is, okay? Uh, we are going to make these entries once, and then we're done consolidating forever, theoretically, okay? So uh, when we say consolidations, in this case, we're only consolidating once. We're gonna consolidate when we acquire the investee and we put them on our books, okay? So everything here is gonna look exactly like the equity method, okay? So let's start off with the example here. Let's assume that we have, we, uh, the investee has current assets of 300,000, equipment of 400,000, capitalized softwares of 100,000, customer contracts of zero, we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, notes payable of 200,000, so their net asset is $600,000. Now, their net assets are $600,000. That's what their balance sheet says, okay? But if we were to take the fair value, what are they actually worth today in the open market? We would see that current assets would still be 300,000. Equipment would be 600,000. So the equipment on our books are 400,000. But if we were to sell them today on the open market, we'd get $600,000. Why is there a difference? There are many reasons. This, uh, one of the reasons might be that the asset uh, or the equipments have appreciated in value. Uh, that might be a rarity, but they may have appreciated in a value. The other reason that this might have occurred is because we took too, or the investee took too much depreciation over time, which is more than what we should have done from a fair value standpoint. So they took a ton of depreciation that left it with lower book value, but it's worth more, okay? Now, capitalized software, let's say the reason why we are buying this investee is because they have valuable software. And because they have valuable software, this is why we are buying it. The valuable software we believe is worth 1.2 million, not 100,000, which is how much they theoretically spent on making the software, the book value that they still have left, okay? Customer contracts. So uh, the, in this case, customer contracts, when we sign a contract with a customer, we don't put anything in our books. We don't put any liabilities. We don't put anything in our books for that contract. However, that contract obviously is gonna be worth something to another company that buys this company. Um, if I know, if I'm like Boeing, which has contracts for uh, airplanes that are in, in, in future years, uh, Boeing's contracts are going to be very valuable because I know I'm going to get revenues from those contracts when I deliver the planes. So these are kind of forward-looking revenue contracts that are worth something to me if I were to buy this corporation. They mean nothing to the corporation that holds them because we can't consider them an asset just because we have a contract that says that they might get X amount of dollars when they uh, provide this service. So those contracts are worth something to us um, externally. Think about Goodwill. We can't actually internally develop Goodwill and put Goodwill up here. Uh, we have to buy Goodwill. Same thing here. If we're going to put customer contracts on our balance sheet, it's because we are buying those, not necessarily we've developed them internally. And then notes payable um, is $200,000. Um, that may be the present value of future value, uh, present value of uh, payments, but it really should be 250,000. So this company technically is worth 2.55 million dollars, not necessarily 600,000. 
Now there's three instances under the uh, consolidation method that might occur. One, we pay for what they're worth, 2.5. Uh, another option might be we pay more from it because we are so invested in this corporation that we we're willing to put more money to the table even though we're only getting what we believe is 2.5. And then the third situation might be we're gonna pay less. Now this is a very rarity, but let's say these people are trying to get out of business very quick. The only way that they can get out of quick is maybe to lower their price. So instead of getting 2.55 million, they'll, they'll accept $2 million just to get out of the business very quickly or something happens. Maybe this is in bankruptcy. And so in order for the judge to move it along and get it purchased, um, they're willing to get a bargain purchase of $2 million, $2 million versus 2.5. Now, in the equity method of accounting, we talked about what happens when we pay for uh, another organ or another corporation more than their book value. So, you know, if we were looking at the books, we'd pay six hundred thousand. Obviously, we're not going to pay six hundred thousand because they have some very, very valuable assets that are worth more. Why sell a six hundred thousand dollar corp when it has capital software, capitalized software that's worth one point two? It's stupid, right? So we are going to get 1.2 for those capitalized softwares rather than the 100,000 over here. So an equity method of accounting in that lesson we talked, that, talked about, if we pay more for the organization than its book value, we allocate the additional amount to the difference between the book value and the fair value. So for instance, if I were to pay 2.55 million dollars for this organization. I'm going to allocate that 2.550 to the increase in the asset, the equipment, the capitalized software, the customer's contract, the notes payable, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So uh, on my books, I'm acquiring $300,000 in assets, $600,000 in equipment, 1.2 million in capitalized software, $700,000 in customer contracts, and then I'm also acquiring $250,000 in liability. These book values don't mean anything to me as the acquirer, okay? So three situations that might occur. One, the purchase price is 2.5, which basically means we're gonna pay them exactly what they're worth, okay? No more, no less, exactly what they're worth, okay? This is what we like to call equal to fair value. Makes sense? Fair value, we're paying equal to fair value. Number two, purchase price is more than fair value. So fair value is 2.5. We're gonna pay 3 million for it. We're gonna have goodwill, right? So we allocate all of the additional amount to all of the undervalued assets. These are all undervalued, okay? Undervalued assets. So we allocate the additional amount between 600,000 to 3 million to the undervalued assets, and then whatever's left, we put into goodwill. So we're gonna have a goodwill in this situation here. Now, we really didn't talk a lot about this in the last lesson when it came to equity method, but we'll explain it here today now. This idea of gain on bargain purchase. What happens if I pay less than its fair value? So less than its fair value, two million versus 2.5. Um, in that case, we are gonna book a unrealized gain on a bargain purchase. Why? Because we are gaining from this bargain purchase. We will still book all the assets and liabilities that we, we acquired at fair value because that's what they are really valued at. They're really valued in this case $600,000. So we're not going to discount it in any way. We're just going to go ahead and book it at $600,000 and then we're going to put an unrealized gain on a bargain purchase. Now, before I get to the bottom parts on the journal entries, it's at the end of the day, it's really simple. Um, I've color coded it, so red would mean that we're doing journal entries uh, when the purchase price is 2.5, blue is when it, with the purchase price is 3 million, and then green is when the purchase price is 2 million, okay? So uh, as we go through these journal entries, we're gonna walk through them one at a time. Don't get confused. Um, we have kind of three sets of journal entries up at the same time to show you the contrasting views of these three situations, okay? So again, uh, consolidation, we're making the consolidation because we've now acquired an investee. We're now putting their assets on our books at what we purchased them for. So if let's look at purchase price at 2.5, so equal to fair value, what would our journal entries be? Well, our journal entries would be everything here in red. 
Now everything in black is going to stay the same in all three scenarios. So all three scenarios here, black is going to stay the same. You'll see that in a moment. Okay. So uh, if we had a purchase price of 2.55 million, okay, in my books, as the investor in my books, I'm going to debit assets for 300,000 because that's what they're worth. We don't care about book value. Remember, we don't put, care about book value. 300,000. Equipment at 600,000. Again, we don't care about book value, only fair value. We're going to debit capitalized software at 1.2. Customer contracts at 700,000. We're going to skip goodwill for a second because that's not in red. Um, and then we're going to credit notes payable for 250. And then cash paid for 2.55. If we did all of these, um, if we added all these together, we're going to get um, the same amount. So our journal entries is going to balance. Debits are going to equal our credits, okay? So under the purchase price, we debit all of our assets at its fair value. We credit all of our liabilities we are assuming at fair value. And then the offsetting amount will be your cash paid. Okay, so simple enough. Let's now add part number two. Part number two says, hey, you're worth 2.5, we're gonna give you 3 million. Okay, so we're paying more than the fair value of the assets that we are acquiring. When we do this, we're gonna have goodwill. And so let's walk you through this. We're now looking at the blues, okay? Current asset, 300,000, because what are we doing? We're obtaining this 300,000 uh, of current assets, so debit 300,000. Equipment, 600,000. Why? Because the equipment is worth, has a fair value of 600,000. Again, I don't care about book value, okay? Capitalized software, 1.2 million, debit 1.2 million. Customer contracts, 700,000. And goodwill, goodwill is at 450. How do we get 450? The difference from the fair value of the net assets that we acquire and our purchase price. Well, we purchased it at 3 million. The fair value of net assets purchased was 2.55. Subtract that, we get 450. So that's why we have a goodwill, it's in blue, 450. Now what do we credit? We credit notes payable at 250 and then cash at 3 million. We won't worry about gain on per bargain purchase for a moment, okay? So again, same thing, notice between the equal to and the fair, uh, more than fair value, these are the same, these are the same, these are the same, these are the same, and that's the same, okay? So those are the same, nothing changes. All right. So now let's go with the green. The green is when we pay less than fair value. So we're kind of getting a benefit here, right? We're getting $2.55 million worth of fair value assets, but it's only costing us $2 million, okay? So everything in green now. Current assets, $300,000, because that's what we're getting. Equipment, $600,000, because that's what we're getting. We don't care about book value, because that was book value for the subsidiary or the book value for the acquiree, but it's not our book value. We're purchasing their assets at what they are truly fair valued at. And then capitalized software of 1.2, capitalized software of 1.2, we're gonna debit customer contracts at 700,000, 700,000. There is no goodwill because we're not paying more than the net assets that we are acquiring. We're paying less, so we skip goodwill, so we will not have goodwill. And then we go to our credits. Our credits are 250,000 in notes payable and our credit cash, cash of $2 million. Now because we've written all of these up at fair value, it's not balanced without another credit. That credit's gonna be a gain on bargain purchase. That gain on bargain purchase is gonna be $550,000. How do we get $550,000? We would get the difference of our net assets and how much we paid opposite of goodwill. So in this case, we would take our net assets of 2.550 and then subtract it from 2 million and we get 550,000, which is exactly, almost exactly like we would calculate goodwill. Um, and that's where we get our credit. So all of our, all of our debits and our credits are now equal to each other. Again, notice everything in black,
stayed the same. Now I'm gonna move out of this shot for a second so that you can kind of see what's happening here. We've got all of our current assets are gonna debit at 300,000 under any one of these three instances. Equipment, 600,000. Uh, software, 1.2 million. Customer contract, 700,000. Goodwill is only debited when we pay more than the net assets of, more than the assets, the net asset amount that we are acquiring. Okay, and then notes payable we're going to credit at 250000 and then cash is going to vary based on the circumstances in which we discussed. And then gained on bargain purchases would only happen if the amount that we're paying is less than the fair value of all the assets we're acquiring. Okay, so to kind of recap for a moment here, this is an example of when an acquisition happens of an investor of an investee and we dissolve the investee, which means all of their net assets have to be put somewhere. They are going to be put on our balance sheet, trial balance, financial statements, all of that. Again, when we dissolve them, we will not have two financial statements, so we're, we would only have one because all of their assets are now on ours. Therefore, under the consolidation of financial statement method, under the acquisition method, we do this once and we are done, okay? We are done. We don't need to do any more consolidations because now we're one corporation. Um, the example that I would use is Southwest Airlines and AirTran. Southwest acquired AirTran. AirTran got swept up into Southwest. AirTran is no longer a corporation anymore. Southwest has now all the assets of AirTran and all the intangibles of AirTran on their balance sheet. Going forward, Southwest doesn't need to allocate any specific entries to AirTran and Southwest because now it's all Southwest Airlines, okay? So that's what we're doing here. Acquisition, when the dissolution happens, this is done once and we're done. This is the easiest, um, this is the easiest consolidation that we can do. This is, happens right after the purchase of that investee and we make these entries and then we are done. Okay, uh, the only other things that you're gonna do is you're gonna revalue these at these fair value now and you get it depreciated over its uh, useful life that's left under all of these unless um, it's an intangible then we have some different rules for them. So that is the acquisition method for the consolidation of financial statements when the investee is dissolved.